My wife and I have two boys who are five and four now, and we're also from Northeast Ohio, which means we are tortured sports fans. Uh, last night was a disgusting sports night, I think, for all of us. I'm a, a Buckeye fan, and I, on top of that debacle, I was also rooting for the Brewers, and that ended disgustingly as well. Um, I haven't experienced much joy in terms of sports in my life, and yet I'm, I'm just, I, I don't know, I, I, can't, I can't turn away. I just, I, I want more. And so a few years ago, the Cleveland Cavaliers did something I never imagined I would see in my lifetime, and they won, a, they won a championship, which was really a cool experience. And someone in my family had season tickets. My dad had season tickets, and so I got to go to some of the NBA Finals games, and it was incredible. And, and championships in Cleveland, well, that was the only one in my entire life. And so it's, it's incredibly rare. And so the entire next year, we were celebrating because we'd actually finally won the championship. And one of, the, one of the players on the team at the time was, was, Kyle, was Kyle Korver. He was, a, a, he was a forward who could hit threes, and he, he had become a Cleveland Cavalier. And they were honoring him with a bobblehead night. And because uh, my, my family had season tickets, they got some bobbleheads. And my dad's in his mid-60s, and he's like, what is a six, mid-60-year-old man going to do with a bobblehead? I'm, I'm good. So here, give this, give this to, your, to your boys. And so I it was in my mid-30s, and I'm like, I would really love a bobblehead, but now that my dad's like, give it to your boys, I guess I have to give the other one that I got to my sons as well. I couldn't just be like, here, guys, you have one to share, and daddy has one as well. So I was shamed into giving my children one. Uh, so each of the boys had their own bobblehead, which is this little figure, for those of you who don't know sports, with a giant head that goes up and down. It is as ridiculous as it sounds, and yet somehow cool, all right? So if you don't understand it, the problem's with you, not with us, all right? So, so we had these two bobbleheads. Now, the problem with the bobblehead is they're not, really, they're not really to be played with. And Dean was three at the time, and he loved to carry around this bobblehead. And we kept telling him, buddy, put it down. You're going to break it. And he would. But, you know, I don't know if it's just Dean or if it's every three-year-old. The attention span just isn't really where I would like it to be. And so he would put it down, but 30 seconds later, he'd have it back in his hand and be like, we just talked about this. Go ahead, put it down. And then he'd put it down. And then two minutes later, it'd be back in his hand. I'm like, buddy, you're going to break it. Put it down. And so he would. And he'd leave the room. And then he'd come back into the room. And he'd pick up the bobblehead. And I'm like, you're going to break it. Well, one day, lo and behold, his little three-year-old hand got tired or the weight of the bobblehead was just too much. But somehow the bobblehead slipped out of his hand onto the nightstand by his bed and broke into a couple pieces. It was a beautiful metaphor for my lifelong fandom in Cleveland sports. And yet... And yet, he became shattered at the fact that he had shattered his bobblehead. And he began wailing in a noise I could not replicate even if I wanted to. You would have thought disaster and destruction had come upon this child because he shattered his bobblehead. Now why? Because he didn't listen to the repeated warnings that I had given him. This morning as we continue, it's all about love. We're, we're walking through the book of 1 John. So if you have your phones or your tablets, get them out on the Bible app. You can follow along with us. Otherwise, the verses will be on, on the screens there. We're, last week we saw that one of Jesus' closest friends, one of his best friends, wrote this and a couple other books about his encounter and his time that he had spent with Jesus. And last week we saw that God is light. He built this contrast for us, that God is light, and in Him there is no darkness at all. And so this morning, we're just going to continue what Jesus is, one of His best friends wrote in 1 John 2, where we pick up this morning and we read this. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. 
This is the whole point. This is the whole purpose of his writing. He says, my little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But I, I just want to pull this apart just for a minute because I think it, it shows us some really important aspects about the heart of John, but also about the people that he's writing to. First thing is this, you cannot get around the affection that he had for his audience. You cannot get around the affection that he had for the people that he was reaching out to. So I just want to encourage you, never lose your love for others. Never lose your love for others. Can people be annoying? Yes. They can be incredibly annoying. Can people be difficult? Oh, they can be just as difficult as they can be annoying. Can it be tempting just to write a bunch of people off because they're annoying and difficult? Absolutely. And oh, by the way, this isn't saying that there's never a time in your life that you don't have to sever a relationship. However, if your life is one that you look at and you can't get along with anyone ever, I've got news for you. The problem isn't with everyone else. And I tell you that because I love you, and probably nobody else will, so I'll just tell you. The problem is not with everyone else. It's with you. And you may not, you may not think that. You may think, well, everybody else is a moron and an idiot. And in certain aspects, they may be, but if everyone's that way, it's you. And here John is saying, I love you. My little children. He's writing to them affectionately. And that doesn't mean that he's going to steer away from some things that could be difficult for them to hear. But it means because he loves them, he's going to share those things. See, we do ourselves a disservice when we, in the name of love, don't confront hard issues. We do ourselves a disservice when, in the name of love, we back away from conflict. No, that's not love. Love is being willing to have the difficult conversation. Love is being willing to tell somebody something they don't necessarily want to hear, but that they desperately need to hear. That is loving. And I understand that in our society, we get this backwards a lot of times, and we think that it's a different way. But ultimately, if we love people, we have to be willing to have a hard conversation. But that's built on a deep desire to see what's best for them. And so John writes, my little children, that's how affectionately he feels about the people that are reading this. He says, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. He said, don't do it. Don't do it. Put it down. Stop messing around with it. Stop. Don't sin. This is the warning. This is the warning that he's giving his audience. This is the warning that he's giving his readers. And this is the warning that God is giving to each and every one of us. Stop. Don't do it. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And we're going to break that down in just a minute, but understand the overarching theme here. John's saying, don't sin, stop, don't do it. But if you do, but if you do, there's a fix available. Because God in his infinite love for us, while we rebelled against him, God still loved us. While God warned us and we didn't listen to those warnings and now we've made a mess in our lives. When God told us, don't pick up the bobblehead and we pick it up and then we put it down. But 30 seconds later, it just looks so enticing and it just looks so good. And we just want to play with it just for a little bit because it's right there and it's just so tempting to us. And we pick it back up and God says put it down and then we put it down and then we leave the room but then we come back into the room and the very thing that we've put down a couple other times calls our name once again 
and we pick it back up and then the weight of it becomes too heavy or because our grip isn't as tight as we thought it would be and because we can't control it and make no mistake, you will never be able to control sin. You think you can, but you can't and it will always spiral out of control. And when it does and it, sh- and it, it falls, it shatters and our lives shatter with it. So I walked in the room, see my son crying and screaming, see broken pieces. And I walked over and I had a talk with him about listening and understanding that there are reasons that in his life His mom and I will pull him aside and say, hey, don't do that. Stop. He nodded. I'd like to think it's because he understood, but it was probably just to get me to shut up, but he nodded. (laughs) And then I picked up the pieces. And I got some super glue. And I glued it back together. And when our lives are broken and they're shattered and they're in pieces, God's worked out a fix. Because of His incredible love for us. So maybe you're here today and your life is broken and it's shattered. Maybe you've been just holding on to something for way too long that you've convinced to yourself that you've got this, but it is spiraling out of control and the weight of it is too heavy for you to continue carrying and you're about to lose it and your life is about to be destroyed. Maybe you've already come to that place where you are shattered because of your sin. But if anyone does sin, and we do, we have an advocate with the Father. We rebelled against God, and yet we have somebody on our behalf talking to God for us. Jesus Christ, the righteous. God's Son, Jesus, who is fully God, full divinity, and fully man, full humanity, mixed together in one. He is our advocate. He is arguing on our behalf before God. He is the perfection that none of us can be. Because of my mistakes, Jesus is the payment. Jesus is the solution. Jesus is my fix to the mess of my life. And it's not just for me. But for you and the sins of the whole world. Jesus paid the price that none of us could pay. And that is the only solution the problem that we all have of our sin. And by this, we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Whoever says I know him but does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him, truly the love of God is perfected. By this, we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. And so this is the test of whether or not we follow Jesus. Our conduct. 
our conduct. And I told you all, I am a tortured Cleveland sports fan. Incredibly tortured. I'm actually, in terms of baseball, a bigger Reds fan than I am Indians fan. It all started from when I was a boy just starting to love baseball. In 1990, we celebrated just this week. I know you celebrated as well, along with me, the 28-year anniversary of the Reds sweeping the Oakland Athletics in the World Series. We just celebrated that this week. And as I was coming to love baseball, I was just, I was just seven or eight at the time. And so it was really the age that I was starting to love baseball. And the Indians were, I mean, they were awful. And so the Reds won the World Series. I'm like, that's my team. And uh, unless you think I'm just a front runner, I have stayed with them ever since. And there have been a lot of terrible Reds teams, including recently. Uh, but living in Northeast Ohio, I also like the Indians. As long as they're not playing the Reds, I would cheer for the Indians. And living in Northeast Ohio, there's a lot more accessibility to Cleveland Indians gear than the Reds because the Reds are so pathetic. They generally don't have that far of a reach. And so I was wearing my Cleveland Indians jacket out one time and somebody came up to me at the grocery store and they said, how about that game last night? I'm like, can you believe they blew it? And they just got this real puzzled look on their face. I'm like, I could not believe that they, they messed that game up. They had a three-run lead going into the ninth inning and I know the bullpen has been weak all year, but what, what are they thinking? What are they doing? And they just looked at me and they're like, the Indians won last night. And I looked down and I'm like, oh, they're talking about the Indians, of course. It's <laughs> what I'm wearing. It's what I'm representing. You see, the test for whether or not we follow Jesus is what we wear. Not our clothes, but our lives. This is the test of whether or not we follow Jesus. If you've ever been in the position, in the situation where you're like, I just really wish I knew for sure where I stood with God. There's a way to know. And it's to look in the mirror. Because you wear it all the time. And so if you... If you profess that you've made the decision to follow Jesus and you tell everybody in the world with your words that you love Jesus and yet your life looks nothing like a God-honoring life. And this isn't me saying this. This is John, one of Jesus' best friends and the mouthpiece that God spoke through to write this book. He says there's something out of balance in your life. And you've got it all wrong. And by this, we know that we have come to know him. If we keep his commandments. How we live will reveal whose team we're on. How we live will reveal whose team we're on. And basically, what John's saying here is put your money where your mouth is. Put your money where your mouth is. If you profess with your words to follow Jesus, then make sure with your life you're following Jesus. Put your money where your mouth is. Live your love. Live your love. Don't just profess it. Don't just say it. Live it. That is the test for whether or not we follow Jesus. Beloved, I am writing to you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you had heard from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. And at the same time, it is a new commandment that I am writing to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. And so he says this idea of love is nothing new. And he does a play on words here. He says this isn't a new commandment. This is an old commandment. And think back, when you look at the Ten Commandments, how can you sum up all Ten Commandments? Very simply this, love God, love people. Love God, love people. That's why when the religious leaders of the day thought they were going to trap Jesus in this great 
theological debate, and they were going to show everybody that he didn't really know what he was talking about. They went up to him, and they said, well, there's Ten Commandments, but which is the greatest? And honestly, there's a lot more than Ten Commandments in the Old Testament. They said, which is the greatest commandment, Jesus? What was Jesus' reply? Love God and love your neighbor as yourself. So John here says, this isn't, this isn't anything new. I'm not writing to you a new commandment, but an old commandment. Love God, love people. But then he does a play on words, and he says, but I'm writing to you at the same time a new commandment, which is true in him, which is true in Jesus. Jesus is the fulfillment. Jesus is the fulfillment of every rule, of every regulation that God put in place that none of us can measure up to. Jesus is the fulfillment of that. And when we follow him, it's true in us as well. Not because of what we can do, but because of what Jesus has done. And that is the message of the gospel, that we are not enough. But Jesus is. And he continues, Whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. And remember, we saw last week that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. And here he says, whoever, whoever says he's in the light and hates his brother, he's got it entirely wrong. If you follow Jesus, you will not be consumed with hate. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. And so I'll just tell you again, how you love people reveals who you are. How you love people reveals who you are. It is all about love because it's all about Jesus and Jesus is the fulfillment of love. And Lakeside, we must be a place that is all about love. This is the test of whether or not we really believe what we say we believe. And then John goes on just this. I mean, if you've ever seen a, a, a concert, this is where just the, the electric guitars are screaming and the singers screaming. Or if you're a rapper, he's just spitting out these lines like you wouldn't believe here in these next three verses. He says, I'm writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. I am writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I am writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, children, because you know the father. I write to you, fathers, because because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. I mean, everybody is on their feet and clapping and screaming, because this is awesome. This is the point. Our sins are forgiven. We can know God, the very God that we rebelled against, the very God that we didn't listen to, the very God that we said, I know better than you do, God, and then we made a mess of things. In spite of that, we can still have a relationship with him. We can overcome the struggles that we face. We can overcome all the trouble and the hardship and the heartache in our lives. We can overcome all of that because of what Jesus has has done on our behalf. Now, ladies, I know yesterday you had an incredible time here at the spa day, right? That was fantastic. And, and it's, it's strategic when we do this in October. You may, not, you may not even realize this, but we understand that October can be a really difficult time in, in the life of women. We, we understand that. In the heart of, I mean, October is the greatest sports month that there is. You have the baseball playoffs going on. You have footballs in the heart of the season. Basketball and hockey are just getting going. I mean, all four major sports. And then college football with, 
with the exception of the debacle last night with the Buckeyes. College football is right in the heart of it. I mean, ladies, we understand that this can be a really difficult time for you, not just because it's the heart of sports season, but we are two and a half months away from the launch of a new Bachelor series. I mean, two and a half months that you have to wait to see those roses passed out. We understand how hard this can be on you. And so we just wanted to say, what can we do to help alleviate some of that pain and some of that loss that you're feeling right now, not knowing who's going to get that final rose after a six-week manufactured, manufactured romance and an engagement that'll last two months and then break off. But we understand this can be a really, really hard time for you. And so we wanted to do Spa Day yesterday to help you out. Now, in two and a half months, when The Bachelor comes back, or even, uh, say, say The Bachelor's not your jam, but when Fixer Upper was on, or, or any reality show, what does every reality show have in common? It all builds to the final segment. And then at some point, they try to do a big reveal. They try to hook you in, keep you watching, and it's all built around the big reveal in the final segment segment. It's how the entire show is structured. So you're on the edge of your seat, and if you're watching it live, and that is the one great, that is the one great advantage that reality TV has over every other TV, is that people want to see it live so that they don't get spoilers on social media or being texted by their friends, so you're still forced to watch it live more than you are on a DVR or on a streaming service that streams it later on, so you're stuck through the commercials. And then you get to see the big reveal. Who gets the final rose? What house was picked, and how was it renovated, and how does it look now? Whatever it may be. How does the feast look after they've spent four segments preparing all the ingredients and throwing it into the oven and now it's time to taste and have you ever noticed on the cooking show never never has there been a, a dish that everybody's like nah, take it or leave it everything's this is incredible right? it's all built around the big reveal our lives are that reveal And in the commercial breaks of your life, when somebody doesn't see you for a while, and then you meet back up, what do they see? When you connect with an old friend, an old classmate, an old business associate, When you're reunited, what do you reveal? How does your life look? Because the truth is, we wear what we believe every single day. And how we conduct ourselves. And how we treat others. And in either the love that we display. Or we don't. As followers of Jesus. Let's make sure that we wear love. This world is in desperate need. And as those of us who follow Jesus, who is the very embodiment, we must set the tone. And so right now, in the quietness of this moment, I just want to ask you, who do you need to love? They can be difficult. They can be annoying. Be frustrating. 
but we're called to wear love. This is the test of whether or not we follow Jesus. What do we wear? God, I pray that you'd help us. Be people who wear love. I pray that when people look at us, look at our lives, they would see that we love them. Because we love you. God, you have done so much for us. You have taken our lives that are broken and shattered, and you have put them together. And we aren't perfect, but when we fall, you are there to pick us back up. You have paid the price for us. And so, God, I just pray that we would be people who demonstrate that love to others. That we would make sure that when people see us, they see you. Because of the love that we display. God, help us. Love people. And help them see you through that love. In a world that is desperately in need. In Jesus' name we pray.